Okay, this video is completely out of sequence from what's going to follow. Uh, the document of Mark 13 you see before you is online. You can download it as, and the link, the link will be in the video description, Mark 13 meter R. You can download it as a doc or as a PDF. If you're going to download it as a doc, you, exactly what you see here is what you'll get. But you won't be able to read the Greek if you haven't also downloaded BibleWorks fonts. And the link that you'll need to download those fonts is also in this document in English. Okay, it's now divided into cute little sections. It's a lot more sophisticated than it was before. Here in Notes Matthew, the download link for BibleWorks fonts is right there. Okay? And it is made for Word 2003, which is exactly the version of Word I'm using. Every version of Word after this one tanked. And I do word processing because I do legal documents, a lot of legal documents and correspondence. And I can't have a word processor that don't work. WordPerfect went bad starting in ver after version 9. And Word went bad after 2003. So, And it runs just fine um, in Windows 7. It runs just fine in Windows 8 and 10. I tested it. You have to install it after you install the operating system. That's the kicker. And it works just fine in Lin Linux. I call it Linux. I don't think the right word, I don't think you should call it Linux. You know, you call it Linus, as in Linus Pauling, so you call it Linux. Okay? It works fine in Linux. I have it installed in Linux. Okay? It's not hard. And it's the same software. And it works exactly and looks exactly the same way. I can make it look the same way. So, why do you want to use another software program for word processing? So much for the plug for Word 2003. Oh, by the way, most of the copies that I bought of this are brand new, still in shrink wrap, always get the retail version, never get the OEM version, and they're at Amazon for like 50 bucks or less. Okay? And all this stuff that you see here is customizable. Alright, you can change everything about what you see on screen as far as the window goes. You know, the options. And you right click to customize. And I can change any of these buttons. I can move them out. You drag them here to move them out. Or I can look at new ones and I can, I can drag them in. Like if I wanted to drag in, let's see, uh, nothing particular I want. But how about if I wanted to drag in um, background? I just left click on it, keep the, keep my finger hard down on my left mouse button, and then I can move it like there, or let's see there, or how about that? Nah, let's put it there. See? Now, now it exists. It's wonderful. I have no idea what that background thing does. Alright? And then you'll be able to read the fonts. And that matters a whole bunch because there's a whole bunch of things you can do in Word that you cannot do in a PDF. Okay, but the PDF version of this Mark 13 meter will also be available. Let me show you one of the things that Word 203 does. It'll let me split the window. Now what that means is that the, win the sections of the document now are independent of each other so if I wanted to go to the notes to talk about Matthew and, and Mark in particular I can just go here and read while I'm up here looking at the text see now it's pretty spectacular stuff let me get rid of the window split I had no idea what we were getting into when we started this, you know, it was on nomine nominon who discovered um, Matthew 24. And if you're going to say that about Matthew 24, well, then don't you have to look at the parallel passages? So we did, Luke 21. Well, here's the third one. And the amazing thing about this, there is conclusive 
proof that Mark is the third gospel even if you didn't know the meter you'd know that because the way he words his text I did the synoptics video series on that it's in both YouTube and in Vimeo but if, if you had any doubts left they will be blown away now because all of the metering that Mark does and the way he's using it to plot future history of the Byzantine Empire he's aping the exact style Paul used even though it's a gospel it's a prophecy and what does he pick for his prophetic theme and what does he pr pick for his prophetic style of writing how many syllables why he picks that number of syllables why these numbers it's based on what Paul did because what Paul did in Ephesians 1 3 through 14 is he plotted the future of Western Rome what would become Western Rome to its fall to Odovacher and Mark does the same thing for the Byzantine Empire he plots it one syllable per year like all the Bible writers do starting with Moses in Genesis 1 he plots it one syllable per year and then he takes you all the way to the demise the effective date of the demise not what we call the date of the demise which is 1304 which is after the first Venetian war which I explain here okay you click on that link you'll see it okay that's what's so phenomenal about this I I you know I didn't know this existed I knew about Paul doing it for Western Rome five years six years ago and I found that out by mistake alright that's the first thing he's mapping Byzantium alright that's the first most important thing to know about what Mark 13's meter is he's repackaging Christ's same words Christ's whole Matthew 24 25 is for the whole world going out to 32 um, 3250 minus 7 AD. The minus 7, of course, is the tribulation, so he cuts it off there. Mark is doing the same thing for the length of the Byzantine Empire, but he makes sure that you know that the fat lady hasn't sung yet when he gets to the end, because remember, he's writing in 69 AD. He ends it at 1274 in the meter, which if you were a student of the Bible at the time Mark wrote this, you wouldn't be able to see it in print. I mean, you could, but very rarely because it was so heavy. It was on big smelly scrolls or big smel smelly animal skin, writing on animal skins, you know, moldy and stuff like that. So what you did is you memorized it. Well, you would if you memorized it, you would know, because Daniel 9 is such a famous passage then and now, that the number of syllables in Daniel 9, 24 through 26 is 224. And the 24 matters because that's his first date line, an informal date line. Hi, I'm writing you 24 years before the millennium was supposed to start had there been no church. And what all the Bible writers do is whatever their date line is, they, they mimic it. I call it equidistance. They always mimic it somewhere. Moses started that pattern in Genesis 1 and Psalm 90, which he wrote in the same year. And all the Bible writers follow it. Okay, like when Paul does his meter, he's using 434 syllables, which is 56 left over. But... Ephesians 1 verses 1 and 2 are also 56. They all play this game. So because 24 isn't divisible by 7, he tries to figure out a way to sneak the 24 in there in a way that is divisible by 7. And he manages, therefore, to leave out Daniel 9, 27, which is 7 years span. It's not 7 in syllable counts. It's 7 years in span. See how clever that is? I mean, this this just, and it keeps on going. Let me show you how clever this thing is. Okay, 63 was when the millennium was supposed to start. All right? 
So he keys that. This is every single one of these blepo. See, I, I've got, you can go look at it. The blepo anaphora. Anaphora means repetition. A word that's repeated in a particular way, in a skilled way, in order to make a point or make a book in. That's exactly what the Bible does very often, starting with Moses. And that's kind of what equidistance does, it bookends. And Mark uses blepo to do that. Blepo means see to it, look at it, pay attention. Okay. Every time this word is used, it's marking the death of an emperor or somebody in the emperor's family. Okay. And, it, you know, because it's going to plot Byzantium, it's plotting the Byzantine emperors. But it's not all of them that it plots. Okay? Before there was Byzantium, there was just Rome. So this one is marking the death of um, Titus and the rise of his brother Domitian. And when Paul, Paul did the same thing with his syllable counts. Okay? And it's, it's, it's satire. Because look, if you're dead, you're not seeing anything. The word dead means see, look, pay attention. Yeah, you should pay attention because you're going to die. You should pay attention because now you can see, but there's going to come a day when you're not. This is the kind of wit the Greek drama was known for. Greek and Latin drama was known for. So, I mean, it's not unique to the Bible. This subtlety and this sort of snippiness. And so each one of these marks the death of a Roman Emperor but of course once you got the split under Constantine it's going to split to the Eastern Roman Emperors alright and it's 63 at the end see you got all these words afterwards but just that word just the first syllable of that word is reserved for the death of Titus Titus was the guy who took down the temple see not one stone left on another that Titus did that so now it's time for Titus to see that he thought he was seeing to it that he was doing good for the Roman Empire and if he didn't believe in Christ he certainly was exposed to the gospel he was there and you ain't seeing nothing anymore and everybody's seeing you be dead hint hint you know it's really pointed and, and it goes on like that it, it's, got, it's got very biting satire. Rome, you know, all the Bible's prophecies are like this in the text, but especially once you know the meter, because now you know specifically what it's, who it's biting. Alright? Now I'm going to go a little bit faster. There's nothing here on behind one. I don't know if this is a key word that's used. Samayan is something you see. It's a sign. But I haven't tested it. One of the key things about these things, like blood, this this blepo to this blepo a word it's the distance between the syllable counts from when this starts to when this ends or from when this ends to when this starts or between them is seven it's divisible by seven now what does that tell you that tells you as the writer is writing he's counting the syllables to make sure that by the time you get to this blepo versus the one before he wrote that it's divisible by seven. Now that's a handy thing for you as a reader or as a memorizer because you're going to say, okay, wait a minute, the syllables aren't divisible by seven in my memory. I must have forgotten something. And it's therefore very helpful in textual criticism because one of the problems we got is we got copies that have a hole there. Well, did Mark actually write that hole or did somebody else? Okay, well, if this is divisible by seven without it, and the copyist didn't know about this function of the text, then Mark didn't write the whole. Or, maybe he did, but then there's some other word in here that's going to have to be fixed. Because this is divisible by seven by the time you get here. It's like balancing a checkbook. God is very precise. I, I hope you're getting the idea that, wow, this is really the Word of God. We really have the original words, even though it's been 2,000 years in the interim. Yeah, because the scribes had no idea that syllable counts were used. 
and they didn't know the distance between this word and this word you saw from my previous video they just they just copied one letter after the next and it was only Beza's copy that, that put this I'm in Lego Huminoti on its own line which tells me somebody used to know about syllable counts but that's as close as we got okay but if this is divisible by seven to this and you got all these divisible by seven that are meaningful numbers that relate to the text I mean how much more proof do you want that yeah we got the actual words Mark wrote because the people who copied it didn't know any of this okay and plus you know they were Catholic and a lot of the stuff in here is so anti-Catholic it's not funny and they didn't know I mean, Catholics don't know the difference between a high Sabbath and a regular Sabbath, which is why they call it Good Friday, and they can't admit their error even after 2,000 years. So, of course, God isn't going to enlighten them about this. You want to spit on my word? Fine, I'll take it to somebody else. Okay? Enough of the commercial message. I mean, because I'm not really trying to badmouth the Catholics. I'm very grateful to them, because if it weren't for the Catholics... We wouldn't have the scripture to look at. And I am not talking about them blessing what books or Bible. I'm talking about them copying it. If they didn't copy it, we wouldn't have it. They didn't know what they were copying. Okay, but they did. And it was a lot of hard work to do that. So God bless them all. Everybody who ever copied a Bible or ever works in Bibles, you get paid a million dollars a year. Okay? Because it's priceless as far as I'm concerned. Alright? So the distance between these and uh, four are is divisible by seven. Alright? On top of that, you'll notice that this one, and this is a killer, Christ is basically saying here, and Christ replied, You see all these he's being sarcastic. You see all these beautiful buildings, these great buildings? and it's sevens and 63 means you're in trouble Israel you got seven years left to get to get your vote right and you ain't got it right yet okay but it's a promise isn't it Sheba in Hebrew means seven but it also means promise now promise can be of something bad alright but he's basically saying look I'm God I'm the God man. I'm making a promise to you. Take this as a contractual thing. You see all these great buildings? And he put he pegs it. This is what confused me for the longest time. He he does his sevening at the start of a paragraph as to create the first bookend. And then here's the actual promise itself. Not one stone will be left on another. It's a negative promise. Now all of God's negative promises have benefits to them. They don't feel good, but they have real benefits that, that once you understand what they are, you're glad it hurts. All right? And that ends at 91. 91 was the number. This is, this is the kicker. It's real important to go through this. 91 was what Christ's age was supposed to be when the tribulation started. The stones being down, the temple being down, was what was supposed to happen as the kickoff of the tribulation. So he's keying what they know about the doctrine and what his age was supposed to be had there been no church because this is all Old Testament prophecy. Okay? There was a whole schedule about when Christ was supposed to be born, would he be born on time, when he was supposed to die, would he die on time, how many years were left to pay back the credit because Abraham matured too early relative to the 2100 years that was allotted to the Gentiles, 54 years were old, I mean it's a whole accounting system that I've gone through in my How God Orchestrates Time videos. You can look it up yourself. And you don't need to know the meter for that. You just do the begats and you'll know. Okay, and I did a worksheet called Genius.XLS that maps it all out for you. All right, so everybody in Israel knew this guy talking was supposed to be dying at age 40, but he's age 33. Everybody knew to whom he was talking 
that what was supposed to happen is after he dies, 50 years were supposed to ensue for the harvesting of the Gentiles, then seven years for the tribulation, and at the start of that seven years, he himself was supposed to be age 91. And then, as it were, the millennium would have been a 98th birthday present to him. That would have been 4,200 years after Adam fell was when the millennium was supposed to begin. That was all mapped out by Moses in Psalm 90. Okay? When it says Psalm 90 verse 4, the day of the Lord it says a thousand years, that's the meter telling you what I'm telling you. It's real bald, but you have to know how to count the syllables to see it. And then it's a no-brainer to get to the Christ age. All right, and the Talmud even records it in Sanhedrin 97 through 99. So I'm not the only one who knows this. They just have a garbled version of it today. They think it's 2,000 years instead of 2,100 apiece. 2,000 years for the Goyim, 2,000 years for the Jews. Then Messiah comes. Yeah, and he did. And he had to die by the thousandth anniversary of David's death. But he's here going to die earlier, which means he's dying 63 years before the millennium was supposed to start, rather than 57. Now that's the kicker. He was supposed to live another seven years. So in Daniel 9.26, he's dying at the beginning of the 62nd week, not at the end. If you ran the Daniel numbers out using solar years, you'd realize that, oh, that takes me to 37 A.D., not 30. Yeah. And the scholars get all nervous about that when they do that calculation, so then they come up with the ruse. Oh, but it must be lunar years. And my own pastor used to be dumb enough to do that. He's not dumb enough now. I mean, he was pretty smart on Bible doctrine, but, you know, nobody's perfect. And he got that wrong. He used lunar years, just like Sir John Anderson in The Coming Prince. Everybody copying, everybody's here saying, nobody looking at the Bible. If you just did the Bible's numbers in Daniel 9.26 and you counted the time, you'd realize, oh, wait a minute, that takes us to 37 A.D., not 30. Yeah, because David died a thousand years before that 37 A.D. In 963. A.D. See? All the people listening to Christ talking here knew that. So it's a promise when he says, see? Of course, Titus isn't going to be seeing anything by them, but hopefully the believers will. See to it. Vote well. Vote now. Now here's the next thing. This thing. I'm in Lego Huminhoti. In the Matthew version of the text, do I have Matthew on him? In the Matthew version of the text, same phrase. Here it is. I'm in Lego Humin Hoti. That's 57. Let me get him here. And now you got Matthew at the top. See? I'm in Lego Humin Hoti, I'm in Lego Humin no Hoti, makes it, makes the clause equal 63. Mark is looking at Matthew's syllables. I don't know if you could ask for a bigger smoking gun than this. Mark is looking at Matthew's syllable count at 63 here. But he wants to make sure he gets to 91 here because that's his second date line because he wants to pun the date of Herod's rebuilding because the temple's going to go down, see, so he wants to pun Herod's rebuilding. Alright? So, because he wants to do that, and a lot of writers do, I mean, almost, this is a real common selection, Herod's rebuilding the temple. Peter used it. He won Peter, which, of course, Peter's been dead at this point. Mark is writing to tag him, too. So, Mark wants to hit 91 with that. So in order to do that, instead of... He could have moved this text in front of blepite. Wouldn't matter. In Greek, you, the word order doesn't matter. But it does if you're careful about your syllable counts. 
So what Matthew had done is he used the same phrase so that he would get the 63 he wanted. And he wants the 57 to be a separate clause. See, he puts blepite first also. So that he'll hit 57 first because this is when Christ should have died. He should be dying seven years later than he is. But he's going to die in the next chapter. So, to remind everybody, hi, when Christ is talking, he's seven years younger than he ought to be at the time of death. This is not good. All right? So, Mark is looking at that. I mean, you can practically, it's as if you're sitting with Mark when he's writing this. And he's saying, okay, do I want to have the blepo clause be 57? In which case, I'm going to have to move this around. I mean, I don't need to say the word Jesus. I don't need to say the word Kai Ho. I could just say, I could say Kai Apen Altoy. Okay, so then I save three syllables there. All right, so that isn't that isn't 51 anymore. That'd be 48. Well, no, nah, 48. That's not very that's not very doctrinally meaningful to anybody. So um, I'll I'll add syllables because he doesn't need Ho Jesus in there. He could just say Kai Ipen Altoy. That's all, because everybody knows. Everybody knows that he's the one being spoken to here. See, because it says here, didaskle, teacher. That's the vocative case. Everybody knows who the teacher is. Everybody knows who the disciples are. He doesn't have to say his name here. But he's doing it to pad the syllables to get here so that he can pad the syllables here. And you'll notice the syllables that Matthew's using are many more syllables. Okay, so either the Lord actually said it more than once, and He used also those exact words also, or it's a paraphrase called indirect quotation. It's very common in ancient literature, and we do it too. You know, well, Donald Trump said that he didn't like it. Well, the big question is: is what are you? Are, is what you're saying what Donald really said? If it's substantially what he said, but it's not the exact words, it's accept more than acceptable. All right, that's an indirect quote. So Mark is doing the same thing here, except that he's doing it so they can hit the syllable counts. So you'll notice he's coming up with a much shorter phrase. Oh, you notice all these great buildings. Oh, great buildings. Great buildings. And Matthew just says, you see all this? He didn't have the word great buildings in there. See all these great buildings? Now Christ might have said both things. And Matthew's only recording some of it. And then Mark is rapping because he likes to wrap his text around Matthew. He might be wrapping in these extra words. But he's doing it to get the same 63. Can you see how obvious that is? Now look at the Amen Lego Homie. In Matthew he uses it in order to get to his 63. But Mark is already at 63. Okay? He's not using this to get to 57. Because he wants to hit the 91. So he inserts Amen Lego Homie next. And I realize, because your pure scholar is going to say, wait a minute, brain out. There's only one Greek manuscript where that exists. And that's our boy Biza. And Biza's manuscript was Greek on the left and Latin on the right. And yeah, the Latin says it too. But how do you know the Greek wasn't back translated from the Latin? Here's my answer to you. Here's how I know. Because the copyist or the translator would not know that the placement of the text is to fit Matthew's placement and the people back in those days thought that that Mark's gospel was first they didn't notice this clever connection where the 63 is occurring earlier in Mark versus Matthew 
and right after it occurs in Matthew it gets inserted in order to seven again at 91 because none of those people knew what I just said about Christ was supposed to be 91 when the tribulation was supposed to be exist had there been no church Catholic Church doesn't have any idea about that it has no idea about the fact that it's 2100 years for the going 2100 years for the for the Jews and then Messiah comes you know why because they don't know anything about the Old Testament because they're anti-Semitic and I'm not trying to just single out the Catholics the Protestants are anti-Semitic too the dispensationalists I'm supposed to be a dispensationalist I have never not even my own pastor knew or that I know I've ever talked about the fact that the Sanhedrin has this in it and he didn't know the meter but based on what he did know I could spot it when I started working with it see how deliberate this is this is this is timed to end at 63 this is timed to begin at 63 in order to get to 91 using a slightly different tense of the verb can you see how deliberate it is the wording is deliberate now, in case you have your doubts about that, or say, well, whoop de doo or, oh, that's not important. Let's take a little ride in history to this future mark, 295. Meter is 295. You'll notice it's marked by a 7. And just as with Matthew, you have to add 30 in order to get to the A.D. What is 295 plus 30? 325 A.D. What happened in 325 A.D.? Oh, well, let's see. Our boy Constantine killed Licinius, even though he promised not to. Okay, because I don't know if this is beginning or end of year. Okay. Killed Licinius, who was his sister's husband. Then, then Constantine killed his own wife and his own son. And then he started building new Rome, replete with the seven hills. Ha ha, go look at Revelation 17 if you want to know who's being referenced. So why wouldn't that be called Philipsis? It certainly was for the wife and the kid in Licinius. And it certainly was for the world. Because what was the worst thing about 325 A.D.? Council of Nicaea. Oh, we're going to decide what is and isn't the Bible. We're going to decide what the definition of God is. Honey, those guys couldn't think their way out of a paper bag. They didn't even get the Bible books right. They didn't know about the meter. Bible is self-identifying and self-auditing, as you can see here. If they were so good, if they were so holy, how come a brain out knows this meter and they never did? No offense, but I'm tired of people who have their little, little snippy, self-righteous, oh, well, you know, we're the experts. If you were so expert, how come you don't know this? All you had to do is count syllables. Five-year-old kids are taught how to count syllables in their native tongue. That's how you learn your native tongue. First, you have to learn what a syllable is. And A, B, C, D, E, F, G. Okay, so this is where our boy, Mark, breaks into the Eastern history. Not the West, which everybody knows, but the East, which very few know. You almost have to be a Byzantine Christian to know anything about it. There's almost nothing about it in the, in the media. Nothing, you don't have all kinds of movies about, you know, some patriarch of Constantinople versus, you know, the, the ruler. People don't make movies like that. There are a lot of movies about Caesar and a lot of movies about the popes in the West. You know, who doesn't know Michelangelo? Okay, but what about what's going on in the East? And I didn't know this, but I found out... It turns out that after Mark wrote his gospel, supposedly, according to Greek Orthodox Christians and the Coptics, Mark went and did his ministry in the East. And they make up all kinds of goofy stories about him, just like the West makes up goofy stories about John. But he went there. 
it's pretty likely he actually did. Okay, so every one of these things from now on, honey, is going to be about the Eastern Empire. All right? See, here's our next blepite. And, you know, see, the other one was here. In verse 5, this one in verse 9, the, dif the distance, the syllable count distance between them is divisible by 7. And if you clicked on the note, it would tell you what the distance is so you can test it yourself. That's what the notes are for. You just click on these underlined things. Alright, so he's promising. It's another negative promise. Okay, this is the second time he's, the, he's promising and it's divisible by 7. This is 345 AD at the end. That you're going to be delivered over to the authorities. Now, I want you to see just how clever this is about the East. This is the word for deliver over. It means to betray, to deliver over to authorities. Like, you know, your mom tells you to come home. She wants to make you spaghetti, and you come home, and the police come over. And she's been wanting to get you in jail for a long time. That kind of deliver over. That's what paradidomy means. See, this is paradidomy. Paradosusin. They will deliver you over. You will be delivered over. Okay, see that right in the middle of the word? That's when Constantine dies. Now, Mark had to be looking at Paul when he decided what order to put these words in. Because in Greek you can put them in any order and the meaning's about the same. Paul used the P word also. See, this is P, Pi. Paul selected the middle of Proel Picotas in Ephesians 1.12, the middle of the word, for the 337th syllable, which was the 30, 337 AD in Paul's meter, which is when Constantine died. And you know what day he died on? First fruits, which is what Proel Picotas means. In the middle of the word means you didn't complete the word. You get the pun, complete the word, grow up in the word, complete the course. So he's dying in the middle of it. That was the way Paul used in Ephesians 1.12. And the day that, that, that Constantine died, you check this on the internet if you want, was Pentecost. And the nickname for Pentecost because that's not their name, you know, it's not the Bible's name for it. The nickname for Pentecost in the Bible is First Fruits, which is what Proel Picotas means. At Proel, Constantine is dead on Pentecost. Okay, so our boy Mark, picking the same event, uses a different P, Parado, para instead of Proel Pico. It's paradol. Constantine is given over to death. Because after all, you know, he killed Licinius and his own wife and son, and who knows how many others. And then his son's going to turn around, and before three syllables are up, three syllables equals three years, one of those sons dies. But in the first three months after Constantine died, his sons all got together and said, okay, we got to kill all of our relatives now because they might, might try to take the empire from us. Fruit doesn't far, fall, from the, fall far from the tree. So by this point, Constantine II is dead. Okay? And by the end, you got to go five more syllables here. Kai... I soon, that's three, ah, uh, four, go. Again in the middle of the word. And to the synagogue. Yeah, that's what he's doing when he's dying. That's the second one. Constance. He's going, because he can't get his breath and he's dying. That's when the second son dies. Beginning to get the wit here, and that that that's 350, and that's 355 at the end of the phrase, flaying, 
And that's exactly what was happening to the third and final son, Constantius, who at this point is sole emperor. He's being flayed by Julian in the west. But Constantius and his two brothers, they all die in the east. Okay. And that's where Constantius is too by 355. Julian is in the west. And the troops have just made Julian emperor, and he's not too happy about that. So he starts coming back toward Julian. I'm going to fight you. You know, you were supposed to be my trusted friend. You're my cousin, the only one I didn't kill. And here you are, you know, rebelling against me. And while he's on his way, because he has to fight Persia first, that's six more syllables. Kai, Epi, that's four. Three, he, kai epi he ge. No, we got it one more because it's sixty-one. Mo, three sixty-one A.D. He ge mo, oh, mo. That's your last breath. Mo. Death rattle. And the word. Hegemon means leader. And he's dying in the middle of it. Do you get the wit? Please say yes. We're not done yet. I'm not going to go through all of them because there are too many. You have to know the history though to get the wit. Okay. See this word here? Do, u, ang. You have to pronounce two G's like an NG. Do, u, ang, ge. Yon. You have to use yon. This is a liquid. This is a liquid consonant. So it's do, do, u, ang, gel. You, you just ang, 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 gel. And it's actually the G is a r, l, yon. Do ang gel yon. You know what that means? Gospel! You might hear it called the Evangel. Or the Evangelization. This is where we get the term from. Okay. This word here, to, is a definite article, you know, because you always have to put some kind of article in front of the noun. Greeks like that a lot. Okay, this is 398 AD. See, this is 371. Plus 30 is 401. So now you count backwards. Ta u angelion. 5. So 401 minus 5. Oh, well, it's actually in the middle, is it? Isn't it? Okay. Okay. So 401 minus 5. So that's 401, 400. We'll put that there. Uh, 399. 398 398 AD right at the beginning of gospel <laughs> get this hopefully you're not yet don't be drinking coffee because you're going to spit it up now Jerome was in the east at that time and he had just finished his last gospel commentary on the gospels he translated in 398. You go look it up yourself at 4thCentury.com Jerome's Letters or Fordham University. I mean there are a lot of people who have copies of what Jerome wrote. It's just that I like the 4th century side is better organized than the rest of them. 398. Right at the start of this gospel so Jerome is finishing off his work on the Gospels, okay, at the very point where the word Gospel starts. Now, get the context. And all of the nations first must have preached to them the Gospel. Now, I don't know how much you know about Latin history, but very soon after Christ died, there was a split between East and West 
and the West like the Latin, and the East like the Greek. And if it weren't for the fact that Jerome went East to get the original Greek and Hebrew, the West would have been stuck with what ended up being called the Old Vulgate Translation. It was awful. It's awful. So, first, they got to get the right gospel. Yeah, so God dispatched Jerome, who as far as what he knew Bible doctrine-wise, he was kind of a neophyte. But could he translate well? Oh, yeah. And so God's commemorating that right here because you know what? For 1,200 years, that's going to be the only gospel they see. Your common man can't get it in the Greek and Hebrew. Yeah, because the Roman Catholic Church is kidnapping the, the Greek and the Hebrew. It wasn't until 1886 that your even got the Vatican to relent. Okay? It's not that we weren't able to get them at all, but they had to be snuck out. Then you, you could get in a lot of trouble if you were caught with a copy. But you, everybody was allowed to have the Latin Vulgate which after 405 was supposed to be from Jerome but they kept using the old one too but you see the class the kidding here God foreknows that only the Latin's going to be available honey so he hires a guy even though the guy was a dip when it came to understanding the doctrinal meaning it was pretty good when it came to translating and being you know anal about getting the words right See? Ew, that's good. Ha! Ah! Now I want to say more, but my throat's giving out and it's too dark, so I gotta turn the lights on. So I'm gonna stop here.